Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this special, I guess, installment of the Voice of the Bride webinar. Um, I call it special because in just a few minutes you're going to find out why. I've got some announcements to make and um, uh, just to kind of lay out some of what's been taking place over the last month and where things are going to be heading for us uh, in the ministry. Um, before I do, uh, I just want to comment and let you know um, we've had a lot of interest in our video on demand and uh, Caleb has been putting a lot of effort in updating the video on demand and uh, just over the last uh, few days, uh, last week or so, he has added 20 something messages uh, to the video on demand. Um, they're not always necessarily in sequential order. So I'm going to, I'll give you the, the heading, but uh, one of them is called Restoring the Voice of Healing Conference, one that we did in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, the speakers for that were Bob Jones, myself, Keith Miller, R.W. Schambach, Bobby Connor, and Chuck Pierce. It was quite, uh, quite an eventful conference. I remember it well, and um, a lot of things went on. I remember... Um, I had uh, wanted to bring in R.W. R. Schambach because I had told the story so often of the 26 creative miracles that happened in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, I, I wanted to have that story on, on our tape. You know, I, I have it uh, where he shared it at uh, Benny Hinn's church. It's on our YouTube uh, channel. Most of you may have seen it. But I wanted it uh, to be on one of our <laughs> you know, one of our conferences, uh, one of our archives. And so I invited him over to our conference and he came, had a wonderful time with him. Just uh, behind, behind the scenes, we talked about uh, the miracles. We talked about the meetings with A. Allen. He told stories behind the scenes. And of course, when he took his session, you know, my request of him was that he tell the story of the 26 creative miracles. And uh, he got up there and told every other miracle but that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little frustrating, but bless his heart, he, he, got, uh, he got started telling these stories and they were all wonderful, talked about miracles and things that happened in the meetings of A.A. Allen and his relationship with uh, Brother Allen and all of that. And so, uh, though I didn't get the one I wanted, I got a lot of good stories and so I think you'll enjoy hearing it. He was a great man of God. R.W. Shambach was a wonderful man of God. Um, kind of a carryover, maybe like a, a Joshua or a Caleb, because uh, he was there, saw firsthand what happened in the 50s, kind of like a Paul Cain was, and uh, even Perry Green, who just went home to be with the Lord also. But, um, you know, he was a young man back in those years, and he saw the miracles and kind of carried it over into our day and uh, was able to share with, with another generation of people the miracles and uh, building faith. If you have not watched uh, the clip we have on our YouTube channel of R.W. Schambach sharing the story of the 26 Creative Miracles, you need to watch it because it's a, it's a faith builder. Um, in fact, it's a prophecy. It's a prophecy. I happen to be in the building when he shared that story, the one that's on our YouTube channel. 1991, I happen to be in a meeting in, uh, in in Orlando, Florida, Benny Hinn's conference. And uh, he began to tell the story and just the room became electric. And, and at the end of it, he says something to the effect. He says, he said, I believe God allowed me to be in that auditorium uh, that night to see everybody in the building being healed so I could come and prophesy to this generation, the one living now, what's going to be their destiny. And I felt like that was a prophetic word. So anyway, I didn't mean to go too much into all of that, but I just think you would enjoy it. We have some stuff uh, uh, with Bobby Connor, of course, you know, our friend Bobby, Chuck Pierce. And we have another conference he's put up called Awakening the Generation That Seeks God. Uh, that was done at Word Alive Church, Kent Maddox Church. Uh, some of those speakers were Rodney Howard Brown, Bobby Connor, Chuck Pierce, Kent Maddox, and Sadhu Sundar Selvaras. 
So um, maybe, you know, plug into those. I think you'll enjoy them. Um, uh, over the next several weeks and months, Caleb is going to continue to focus on the video on demand, continuing to add more. Uh, we have, I guess, literally thousands of messages that we have done over the years. And so he's going to add more and more of the ones we think are strategic, getting some of the speakers, especially some of the stuff Bob Jones did uh, since he's gone home to be with the Lord. We have so many things in the archives that we have not yet put up. And so we're going we're gonna to do that. And hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. Well, uh, <laughs> I have an announcement to make tonight. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure where to start. I've kind of labored all day long how to, uh, how to broach this subject. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the, the bottom line up front. Unfortunately, this is going to be the last webinar we're going to have for a while. Um, because I have just discovered that um, I'm going to have to have surgery. Uh, something that's been quite a shock, a surprise, something that came completely out of left field. And uh, I'll be having surgery this coming Monday, Monday the 21st of, uh, of March on my neck. Um, and I'll just kind of maybe just kind of give you the last year and, and kind of walk you through the last year and, and so you'll, you'll know, you know, I talked to some of my advisors, you know, and just asked how much should I share? And, you know, our streamers, you guys have been so much like family. <laughs> you, you really have, you know, I don't know a lot of you personally, I do some, but I hear from you and, and we feel such a rapport and, and a connection with our streamers that uh, we feel like your family and I can already feel myself getting emotional. <laughs> I'm going to try to fight back the tears, but, uh, but um, uh, I'm just going to be transparent. You know, I was back in May when uh, I shared some personal things uh, that went on in my life, and I'm going to do the same again today um, and do my best to, uh, to keep my composure. But um, today is 438 days, 438 days that I have spent hours a day with the Lord. Most of you know my wife, whom I love very much, uh, left on January the 2nd, 2015, and she moved to, uh, to South Carolina. And uh, you heard me share all of that back in May, and I'm not going to repeat that. We've had many of you, many of you have written asking for an update, and I just have been silent on the issue because I've just been praying and asking God to intervene. But uh, just in, in a short answer, there's no change. Um, Wanda s still lives in South Carolina. She's uh, working there and basically has her own life there now. And, um, you know, I've, I said it in May and I, I still say today I love her very much. She's my wife. And I have been believing uh, God. <laughs> The, that uh, for restoration. I believe he's a God of restoration. I believe that. I believe he gets much more glory in a restored marriage than one that's broken. And um, it's been 438 days. <laughs> um, I go home every single night to an empty condominium for the last 438 days. And I say that because apparently uh, this has taken a toll on, my, on, on me physically. That's what my doctor just told me that, um, you know, I'm not anxious. I don't live in anxiety. I don't believe a Christian should be anxious and I haven't felt anxiety. I gotta be honest, I'm a little nervous about this surgery and you'll know why in just a moment when I describe it to you. But, but over the years, over this last year, I haven't felt anxiety, but I have felt a lot of uh, intensity, a lot of focus. I've prayed a lot, just believed a lot, a lot of weeping, just um, contending warfare, um, just all that goes with that. And, um, and, and I think I started to have a little sign of, of some of the stress of that on my body back in, in August when uh, I had taken a trip to, to Wales. And uh, while I was flying to, uh, to Wales, midway across the Atlantic, my, uh, my whole urinary system just shut down my bladder, my uh, prostate, uh, my um, my kidneys, urinary tract, everything just just quit working. <laughs> uh, 
and I was uh, passing blood. Sorry about that, if I have to say that, but but um, it was just excruciating, very very painful. And I get to uh, I get to uh, Wales, and my my poor host Justin Abraham, who is such such a noble man, took me to the emergency room, stayed with me four hours there as they tried to figure out what was wrong with me, and they couldn't. Two specialists couldn't figure out what was wrong. But uh, long story short, just in a lot of pain, and, and I had meetings to do. I had several meetings to do in Wales, and I had several more to do in, in Ireland. And I was going to do my meetings. I was not going to let the enemy keep me from doing that. So we finally came to the conclusion with the doctors they would put in a catheter. <laughs> so I preached 12 times with a catheter, 12 times in both Wales and, and in, uh, in Ireland. And uh, it was excruciating. One of the most difficult things I've ever done. One of the most painful things I've ever done. Come home from that, you know, go to my doctors, go to another specialist. And to this day, they haven't figured out what it was. They do not know what caused it. Uh, they don't know why uh, all of those systems, you know, from the prostate on down quit working. But um, after about three weeks, it just went away. As quickly as it came, it left. So let, that let me know it was a spiritual situation. And so after that, you know, things uh, went back to normal for the most part. Uh, most of you that know me know that I work out every single day. And uh, up until a month ago, up until a month ago, I was in the gym doing 30 and 40 set workouts with guys half my age. <laughs> and, uh, you know, heavy workouts. And, um, you know, seemingly feeling, feeling fine. And on uh, February the 1st of this year, something happened. I uh, woke up one morning with uh, excruciating pain in my shoulders and in my, in my back. Turns out it was shingles. Never even, I had heard of it, but I had no idea what it was. Much less that I could possibly have it. And uh, turns out it was a blessing in disguise, if, if uh, you can say that. It was extremely painful. It happened on, uh, on February the 1st. Um, on my right side, left some pretty severe scar, scarring uh, on my shoulders and uh, on, on my back. But the good part about that was that exposed a more serious problem. And this is what I'm going to end up having to have surgery for. Because that happened, um, literally overnight, I lost 80% of the strength in my left hand. One day I'm in the gym working out, picking up weights, you know, doing what I do to work out. Literally the next day I can't pick up a glass of water. Can't pick up 20 pounds. So I knew something was obviously wrong. Um, I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but, but uh, my counselor said my streamers want to know, so just be as transparent as possible, and so that's what I'm doing. Um, so I ended up going to an orthopedic, uh, orthopedic man, and they did just a few tests. They ran just some regular x-rays and saw some serious problems and um, ended up having to do an MRI, which was no fun. But uh, they did an MRI somewhere around the second week or so of, of, um, of February. And as soon as they got the MRI, the doctor calls me in and, and starts talking surgery. And I'm like, wait just a minute. Let's slow this thing down just a little bit. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I'm in the gym working out, and you're talking to me about surgery. Turns out what I have is called spondylolithesis. Let's see, let me say spondylolithesis. Spondylolithesis. And uh, they believe it was from a trauma, most likely a car wreck. Many years ago, I was in a serious car wreck. And two of the vertebrae in my neck have protruded forward substantially. It's something I've had for years, have just lived with it, unaware of the problem. And uh, it turns out that it uh, has pushed so far forward that uh, the vertebrae are actually pressing against my spinal column. And uh, the doctor said it's just uh, the grace of God that nothing happened. He didn't use those terms. <laughs> I did. But he said it's just fortunate that, um, that I was not in any kind of accident or anything because it could have been fatal. But uh, after doing the, the study of the MRI, they've decided they need to go into my, into my neck and uh, 
remove two of the discs in my, in my neck, one high up and one down low, uh, replace them with titanium uh, spacer discs uh, where they will take uh, some bone from my, from my pelvis and inject the bones into the spacer disc and uh, carve out some bone spurs that I have. And then here's the big thing, they're gonna move the, the disc back that are putting pressure on my spinal column and put in two titanium plates. And maybe Caleb has some pictures there of what that's gonna look like. And um, they said it needed to be done right away. And uh, so uh, there we are. I go in Monday of this, uh, of this week and uh, I'll be having surgery. <laughs> um, you know, I have been so blessed doing these webinars. I have been excited about them. I've been excited about uh, the response of the people. <clears throat> I held on pretty good so far. <laughs> but, <clears throat> Uh, they're going to go in and uh, on Monday morning and put in the titanium plates and uh, said that I'll be laid up probably four to six months. Um, Caleb wanted me to bring the brace. I'll be wearing this brace. I think they said four to six months. Is that correct? Two to three, three months. Two to, two to three months. I'll have to wear this brace pretty much all the time. Um, anytime I'm not in bed, I think I'll have to wear this brace. Um, and, uh, you know, um, hopefully everything will go well. Obviously, I need your prayers. Um, I've been a little, uh, you know, I'm not a nervous person. I've had many surgeries. I've had broken bones. I've had pins put in my shoulder. I've had uh, hernia operations. I've had appendix. I've had a little tumor removed from my abdomen. But this has got me a little, uh, you know, a little, um, uh, I don't want to use the word nervous. That's not the right word because, you know, we, we Christians, we're not nervous. But I, enough that I cherish your prayers. Um, just the idea that they're going to put me under for anywhere from three, four, or five hours going into my neck, uh, operating um, on my neck like that, drilling screws and all that, just... You know, just a little bit bizarre. I mean, just to think the other day I'm in the gym working out, and here I am now tonight talking to you about about having titanium plates put in my neck. So I've, I've just uh, been been a little bit shocked, a little bit surprised. But uh, you know what? Just as soon just as soon as I can, I'll be back in here doing these webinars. Just as soon as the doctor will release me, um, we're going to pick right back up where we left off. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sorry for those of you that were so excited about the webinars um, because I've gotten so many emails <clears throat> of how they've impacted you. And uh, help me, Lord. And so anyway, <clears throat> I apologize for that. But uh, anyway, I'll have, uh, I hope you'll pray for me. I know you will. Thousands of you will, will see this and will pray. Uh, my daughter will be there with me um, Monday morning. My son, of course, and my daughter-in-law. My two grandsons would be, but of course they, they can't be. And uh, two of my pastor friends will be there, uh, Steve Shelley and Arnie McCall. Those are the people that be that will be there with me, and uh, and uh, they're the ones that love me the most. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, I, um, and I know a lot of you will will pray, and uh, so I'm trying to trying to push things back. I know there's a lot of people that love me. I don't mean to I don't mean to say that the wrong way. I've got a lot of friends that would be there at a heartbeat if they could but they only are allowing a few people to, to come in. So I, I didn't mean to say that the way it sounded. So many, so many of you, I've got my own brothers and, and different ones, but, but, um, but these guys are gonna be there and they're praying with me. 
And, uh, and so anyway, I hope you'll pray as well. Um, just on a practical note, um, we're at the mercy of God. <laughs> this was the only thing we were doing in the area of, uh, of income. Um, we have partners that have helped us and, and, um, and we, uh, we have appreciated that. And I'm not going to get stressed out about it because God's got us covered. And I believe, I believe people out there love us enough that they'll help us. And I'm not going to make big appeals. I'm not going to write any letters sending them out to our mailing list asking for people to send money. I'm not going to do that. I just believe those of you that uh, care for us will help us and God will see us through it. It will come out on the other side uh, just as well off as we were before. I believe that. I have faith for that. So anyway, uh, amen. Uh, have I missed anything, Caleb, that I need to say? Uh, yeah, we're going to, just as soon as I can, Caleb's going to get a video camera uh, into the, I guess, the condo. Natalie will be staying with me at the condo. <laughs> Bless her heart. You guys play for Natalie. She'll be taking care of me. <laughs> but, uh, but just as quick as we can, I'll do some video updates. I'd rather do video updates than email updates. Just to, he'll come in with a camera, maybe do a little two, three, three minute blogs. I'm going to do as many of those as I can. Share whatever the Lord has been, has been, uh, has been given to me, and um, and hopefully keep you plugged in, keep you updated. Um, you know, you can email Caleb and just any updates that we have. We'll try to make them available to you as quickly as possible and, you know, as expediently as possible. And uh, I felt a little bad about something I said that those are the ones that love me the most because I know a lot of people love me. I didn't quite mean it the way that sounded. A lot of people uh, love me would, would be there in a heartbeat, but these are the ones that are going to be in the room there is what I meant to say. I hope you understand what I, what I meant by that. Um, don't want to don't hurt anybody because I have so many. many, so many friends that, uh, and I know I'll be hearing from you, and some already have been writing to me, words gotten out. I've had so many of our friends that are making commitments to pray, uh, to pray for the ministry, to pray for me. Um, my, my prayer is that, that, it, that it's better than it was before. Uh, there's a problem there now that I didn't know about. Once it's fixed, then I'll be good to go, should be good to go. Maybe, you know, this is why the Lord had me, you know, when, at the beginning of this year, the Lord told me not to take meetings. And I thought, that's kind of unusual. Um, so I just thought, well, maybe it was because I'm to focus on the webinars and, and some other things that I'm, that I'm supposed to do. And, and, and I believe that was true, but he knew, he knew this was coming. I did not. And so we've already kind of blocked, uh, you know, blocked the year aside and uh, we had two meetings. Rick Joyner was very gracious to release me from the meeting that we had with him, obviously. And then, of course, the people in Minnesota were very gracious. Um, in fact, they probably were very pleased because we called Bobby Connor, and Bobby's going to step in and do the meeting for me. So they're probably elated about that. But I'm going to go back up there and fulfill that obligation at some point in the future also. But uh, you know what? God's on the throne. I just want to say that. God's on the throne. This took me by surprise, but you know what? It didn't take God by surprise. Um, and uh, I'm not shaken by that. The Bible says he sits in heaven and laughs. He laughs at the enemy. And uh, whatever the enemy's plans and plots and schemes and devices are, you know, the Lord knew them. And uh, you know what? He, he's sovereign. He rules. If there's anything you have learned from me is that we believe in the sovereignty of God. Uh, we believe in the goodness of God. We believe He has everything under control. He saw this event coming before the foundation of the world. And He knew it was going to happen, so I'm not the least bit concerned about that. And, and you know, what I want to do is I want to esteem the Lord as holy. Uh, this is not something I, I'm looking forward to, but you know what? I esteem the Lord as holy. Uh, maybe there's something that, uh, you know, I needed to get out of this. I don't know. Who knows what the reasonings are?
but I'm more confident in God than I've ever been. So, amen. I would like to talk about um, the chart. <laughs> if we can shift gears, I know this has been kind of heavy, but uh, I did want to leave you with something to think about while I'm gone, uh, while I'm out of the picture. Um, the, last, uh, the last webinar, we talked about the messengers of God. <clears throat> and... Uh, we see in the book of Revelation chapter 1, the Lord holds seven stars in his hands, which are the messengers, the angelos, the, the messengers of God. And if I can make this shift now, if we're able to do that, I want to just talk about that for just a minute. I want to maybe just introduce the chart to you tonight, talk about some of the elements of that chart. Because in the last webinar, I talked about messengers. Uh, messengers in general, that we are anticipating messengers of our day. But as it relates to the book of Revelation, as it relates to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, there were seven specific messengers. There was a messenger to the Ephesian church age. I, I, I know you may not be able to see this chart as I'm holding it here, but you have it there, where I have drawn out over 2,000 years of church history, really beginning around, we, we put the day of Pentecost, but, but for the most part, uh, the early emphasis of the church went to the Jewish community. And, and the emphasis went to the Gentiles really around 52 AD. Uh, of course, you have Cornelius, uh, his household being saved with Peter and all of that, but, but it was with the founding of the church of Ephesus. Uh, Paul founded the church of Ephesus, and, and it was with that church that you began to see a real emphasis on the Gentile church. And, and without a question, without any uh, reservation, I believe we can say wholeheartedly that the apostle Paul was the predominant messenger to the first church age, which was the Ephesian church age, which went from around 52 AD to 170 AD. Now, uh, I want to be quick to say he wasn't the only messenger. We know that. There were many messengers. But he had a predominant breaker anointing. He had something that he carried in the area of a breakthrough anointing that brought the mystery, this great mystery, that the kingdom of heaven, that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was being offered to the Gentiles. And so he was the one that carried something that, that released and launched something in the realm of the Spirit. And it established that truth, and it was the foundation of the church. It was the foundation of the Gentile church age. And, 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 and it had to be right. It had to be absolute. And, and that's, why, that's why Paul could say um, that, that if anyone preached any other gospel but the one he preached, let them be accursed. And, and what you need to understand, you have, you have here in this chart, which is a chart I put together that I hope gives you some mental image of how to see Revelations chapter 2 and 3, but you see the Ephesian church age and it overlaps into the next church age, which was Smyrna, which overlaps into the next, which is Pergamum, and overlaps into the next, which was Thyatira, and to the next, which was Sardis, to the next, Philadelphia, and to the next, Laodicea. Now what you need to understand, you're laying that out over 2,000 years of church history. And as we get back to the webinars in the future, we're going to begin to take each of those seven churches as they're listed in Revelation 2 and 3 and talk about the admonitions, the corrections, and even the blessings that were given to each one and lay them out historically over those 2,000 years. But, but what you need to understand, a principle that you need to understand that we can kind of lay the foundation for now is this, that, that, that there is not, when the Ephesian age stops, it doesn't end overnight. It overlaps. You have the Ephesian church age where the message that was given to the Ephesian church age was the predominant message. There was the messenger that brought that message. The people that lived during that generation were responsible for that message and how they responded to that message determined their destiny. It determined their destiny. If they responded to the message, if they embraced the message of the hour, if you will, 
then they were sealed in as an overcomer and became a part of the bride of Christ. If they did not, they could still be a believer, but be a part of the church. And then as time went on, as 170 rolled around and you began to see a shift politically, economically, and, and um, because you have spiritual forces at work. Uh, let me just you know, pause right here, if I may, and, and, and inject two points. Number one, you have released on the day of Pentecost the white horse rider, which was the spirit of Antichrist. You have released at the same time, I believe, the, the attributes of the four living creatures. Now, if you'll notice, when you go over into Revelation chapter 6, you'll notice that the first living creature says to John, come and see. The, the, the image of an ox says to John, come and see. And John went over and he saw the breaking of the first seal and he saw the going forth of a right, white horse rider having a bow with no arrows, etc. And a crown was given to him. So what you see there are two Two competing, uh, competing is not a good word. You see two opposing spiritual dynamics. We know that the four living creatures stand around the throne of God and they, they have meaning. There is a purpose. There is a, there's a reason why they stand guard around the throne. I know that uh, in some ways they represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we'll talk about that another day. But if I can just kind of give you the shortcut version right now because I don't have much time tonight without going into a whole lot more detail that would require much more time, uh, what, we, what we understand, what we know prophetically is that the attribute of an ox, the attribute of the ox was delegated to the church of that Ephesian age through the Holy Spirit as a, as a counter, as a, as a combatant, as, as an opposing spiritual force to oppose the white horse rider, which was counterfeit Christianity, which we see identified already in, in the book of Jude, another gospel, another Jesus, and another spirit, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we see already in the early church, even among the Christians, people that were be began to oppose the gospel, that began to oppose the revelation of Jesus Christ as it was given to the messengers. And so you have this this dynamic at work. You have two opposing forces. You have the white horse rider, which is a spirit that would rest upon people. That spirit would, would make some of those people say they were apostles, but they were not. If you remember in the very first church age, the Ephesian age, the Lord commended them because they, they uh, recognized people that call themselves apostles, but they were not in the very first church age. And that was that spirit. That was the white horse rider. Uh, trying to self-appointed leadership that presented a different message. And, and so what you see there is a, a releasing, a, a, a battlefield, if you will, between people anointed with the spirit of an ox and people anointed with the spirit of that white horse rider. That is it. That is spiritual conflict. That is what we see in every church age, but especially in the first church age. You see an anointing of the Holy Spirit falling upon people. Then you see an anointing of a counterfeit spirit falling upon people, combating, fighting, trying to undermine the very thing the Holy Spirit is trying to do through those anointed with His Spirit. And, and you see that progression. You see that progression as we go into the seven church ages. Now here again, I'm not trying to teach the whole paradigm right now. We'll do that, uh, the Lord willing, as soon as He gets me back up here. But I'm just trying to lay out for you the understanding, just some very basic understanding of, of this chart so you can begin to study it. So you see the next church age, which is Smyrna, and, and you see a, a different messenger. And for this uh, church age, it was Irenaeus, 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 uh, been pronounced different ways. Uh, there were many messengers, but a prophet felt like the Holy Spirit, William Branham, identified him as the predominant messenger of that age. There was a message that went to that generation unique to their generation because things have evolved. Things did not remain stagnant. The white horse rider began to gain power. I always remember the white, red, black, and pale horse riders are the spirit of Antichrist. It is the opposing force. 
and it progresses, it grows, it gains political power, it gains economic power, it, it, it gains spiritual power, and it has one goal and one goal only, and that is to undermine the revelation of Jesus Christ in every age. And so you see the second, um, you, you see the second living creature, which was that of an ox, say to John, come and see. And he saw, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, well, that's right, I'm sorry, it was an ox. The ox says to John, come and see. And John went and he saw the breaking of the second seal and a red horse rider went forth. And you see the attributes of that red horse rider is to take peace from the earth. It was a war. Uh, and and uh, here again, I'm having to do a very abbreviated description of this right now because I'm not trying to teach the whole thing, just give you an introduction. But what you see happen is peace was taken from the earth. That white horse rider was all of a sudden given political power and, that, and he became bloody red. There was a spiritual organization. You know, you have at one point pagan Rome and pagan Rome certainly had a blood red sword when they began to martyr Christians. Uh, and, and we see that pagan Rome ended, but then you had another form of Roman Romanism that emerged that was just as bloody, just as bloody. I'm not trying to criticize history, uh, any church, but history itself tells us that uh, the, the Roman church killed a lot of people. It's just a matter of history. Read Church Fathers. Read uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs and all these different historical documents. And so what you see I'm here again, I'm just trying to introduce to you these dynamics so you can begin to understand them. But you see a red horse rider and the opposing spirit or the anointing of the Holy Spirit to combat that was that of an ox. Was that of an ox. And when a person got the Holy Spirit, listen very carefully because I do not want to lose you here. When a person received the Holy Spirit during this age, they received the anointing of a sacrificial beast of burden. An ox was a sacrificial animal. We read in history some of the most amazing documentation of Christians taken to the gallows, fed to the lions, set on fire. Some of the most hideous, horrible, torturous deaths imaginable. And what we read in history is that these saints of God sang and rejoiced at the, at the privilege of laying down their life for the kingdom of God. Now, how many of you know that's not natural? That's not natural. That is supernatural. And that anointing that came upon them, that of an ox, allowed them to. 57 million, 57 million of our brethren were, were butchered and slain. You can read for yourself. In fact, I'm going to, you know, in, in these future webinars, I'm going to provide for you documentation from either Fox's Book of Martyrs or some of the, the, the Nicene Fathers uh, of instances, specific instances where people, while they were being drawn and quartered and, and, and beaten and all that went on, singing and rejoicing and considering it their greatest honor to lay, lay their life down for the kingdom of God. That, that took God. That took God. That took something supernatural. And so, so now, if I can just kind of bring you up to date, what you have now, you have, you have seven church ages. And to each age, there is a messenger. And those messengers are bringing the message of these opposing forces. The anointing of the Holy Spirit in the first age had the attributes of a lion. Here again, I'll explain that in much more detail in the future. And then we see it progress we see it shift somewhere around 312. Smyrna, of course, began the, the age of martyrdom, but it began to really escalate around 312. And, and you see for almost 1260 years, the age of martyrdom, the age of the, the dark ages. And these saints of God were anointed with the, with the spear of an ox. But, but then we see it shift again. Uh, we saw that happening through the Smyrna age, the Pergamum age, the Thyatira age. But then something shifted, something happened 
around 1520 A.D. And God remembered. He said, I remember my promise. I remember my promise. I will restore, saith the Lord. And he sent a messenger. And that messenger was Martin Luther. And he was the one that nailed his 95 theses to the church doors that the just shall live by faith. And what you see then is the, the third living creature say to John, come and see. And he saw a black horse rider going forth and the, and the attributes of a man were the ones, was, was the living creature that told him to come and see. And, and what we see from history, here again, I'll prove it to you in history, what you see are men anointed with an incredible spirit of reformation. That's what the man anointing is. The, the church had been without the scriptures for 1,000 years. And what the church needed were men and women that were incredibly brilliant theologians to reestablish the foundations of the faith. Just imagine, just imagine if we had, if we went 100 years without the scriptures, what would the condition of the church be? What would belief systems look like? Uh, and here we had it for a thousand years. So God sent messengers that were anointed with brilliance. Spurgeon, Knox, Finney. And, and you can begin to read some of the writings of these great men of how they began to reestablish the foundations of faith. How they began to reestablish what it meant to be justified by faith. Even uh, going over into the age of John Wesley being sanctified by the washing of the water of the word. And so you see very clearly this anointing. When, and, and here again, this is what I want to emphasize once more. In every age, there was a message and the, and the people's adherence to the message determined their destiny. If you heard the message of the hour, then you were sealed in as an overcomer because every, each of the seven churches was given a message and to him that overcame, they received a benefit. I feel like I'm giving you so much information right now. I hope it's not information overload. But this is going to be, it'll be archived and I'm having to do this tonight because this is my last chance for a while. So I'm just trying to give you a lot. So don't, uh, don't try to take it all in right now. Go back and listen to the archive. But, but the message was embraced and those that embraced it were sealed in as an overcomer and they received the blessing of an overcomer. There was a message that Martin Luther brought to the Sardis age, the just shall live by faith. And those that embraced that message became an overcomer. They overcame the spirit of the age. They overcame the spirit of a black horse rider in order to embrace that the just shall live by faith. You might say, what was the black horse rider? Well, uh, that, that's when, you, you know, they sell bread for a penny and all of that. You see that in the scriptures. That's basically where you start to see the selling of indulgences, the selling of prayers, the creation of purgatory, paying a priest certain sums of money to get the per, their, your family members out of purgatory. Listen, there is no such thing as purgatory. Listen, there is no such thing as purgatory. If there is somebody that has believed that, I'm so sorry you believe that, but there is nowhere in the Word of God that says there is anything called purgatory. You are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, period. There is no other name by which men may be saved other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not saved by being members of an organization. You're saved by being members of Christ, being joined to Christ. Don't ever forget that. Now it's interesting. Each age is only responsible for the message of their age. Now, now here we are. Let me see if I can explain that in a way that helps. We know that it's important to be sanctified by the washing of the water of the Word. We know that. But when God was restoring truth to the Sardis age, they weren't responsible for that because the message of that hour was the just shall live by faith. That was what they had to get established. It was a progression. It was called a progressive restoration. A progressive restoration of the foundations of our faith. Then the next age, John Wesley comes along, who was the messenger to the Philadelphian age. And he brought the message that 
we are sanctified by the washing of the water of the word. Now, we, we, are, we are responsible for two messages, just your love by faith and sanctification by the washing of the water of the word. Then you come to the next stage, which is the Laodicean age. And now you have the restoration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we are more responsible than any of the ages. We are responsible for the truth that the just shall live by faith. We're responsible for the truth that, that we are sanctified by the washing of the water of the word. And we're responsible for the truth that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for now, that the gifts of the Spirit are for now, that speaking in tongues is for now, and so on. And, and every single outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we have had especially in the 20th century, has been to reestablish a truth that is not optional. It's not optional. It is not optional. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If God says it, he expects us to believe it. It's not okay to reject the word of God. I know sometimes people feel like, you know, I'm a believer, but I don't, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus I have accepted his blood for the remission of my sin, but I just don't believe in healing. That's not okay. That's not okay. Uh, that's sin. It's unbelief. It is unbelief because the scriptures are clear. We have been living in an age of profound healing. We have been through two or three profound expressions of healing revival just in the last 100 years, and even now, miracles are commonplace. People are being healed undeniably, so it's not okay uh, to, to reject any portion of the Word of God. We are responsible. We in the 21st century are more responsible than any generation before because truth is being restored, and we have the flying eagle anointing. The, the final, the, the, the fourth seal the fourth living creature, which was that of a flying eagle, told John, come and see. And he saw a pale horse going forth. And the flying eagle anointing is the anointing that is the antidote to that. Because this last age, the age in which we are living, the age that, that is called the age of Laodicea, lukewarm Christianity, when a person receives the Holy Spirit, the first thing you want to do is soar. The first thing you want to do is fly because that's the anointing. Now, we still have the ox. We still have the, the, the eagle. I still have the lion anointing in me. You still have the lion anointing. We still have, there are still sacrificial things going on. We still have the, the necessity of the anointing of a man because all four of the living creatures that stand around the throne are always active but the predominant one, the predominant one is that of a flying eagle. And when you receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you get wings. You get wings. And that is why every single believer that has the Holy Spirit can be revelatory. It is the antidote for lukewarm Christianity. It is the antidote to get above the things of this world. It is the antidote to get above lukewarm Christianity. It is the antidote to get above false theology and false teachings and all the false prophecies and, and all that goes with it, all the, 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 uh, the, in, the discouragements and, and all that goes with it. We have a flying eagle anointing and our admonition is to fly. Many times in meetings, I have, I have prayed for people and, um, and, and I could see that they had wings, but somehow the enemy had, had so um, either deceived them or just done a number on them. Uh, all it took was just kind of break this limitation off of them. And, and I tell them sometimes, just spread your arms. And, and invariably that would happen and the wind of the Holy Spirit would pick them up right there in the meeting and they'd begin to soar. And as you go higher and higher, the heaviness of the things of this world fall off. And so that's, that's our blessing. I love something that Bob Jones said one time. He said, you know, um, he said, what you've got to do is get above the snake line. <laughs> what you've got to do is get above the snake line. Let me let you think about that one a minute while I take a swallow of water. 
the story goes that on a mountain that, that there is a certain altitude that a snake will not go any higher. I don't know what it is. Uh, I could do a little research maybe and we could find out. But let's just say a, a mountain is, you know, 10,000 feet high. And there may be some serpents on the mountain, but the, but, uh, the serpents will only go to about 8,000 feet. So that means what you've got to do is spread your wings and go above the snake line. Go above the snake line. That's where all the lies of the enemy begin to fall off. That's where discouragements begin to fall off and so on. Well, amen. Um, let me just rehash this one more time. <laughs> what we have here are the seven church ages. Each age overlaps into another. It doesn't just end overnight. You have as the Ephesian age and the message of the Ephesian age begins to come to an end, the, the Smyrna age begins to, to become more apparent. The same is true with the next age and the next age. And to be very honest with you, there are no more ages. There are only seven church ages. So what comes after the Laodicean age? The kingdom. The kingdom. And right now we are living in a time when, when the Laodicean age is getting thinner and thinner and the kingdom is getting thicker and thicker. More and more revelation is coming concerning the kingdom and less and less about church as we have known it. Not ecclesia, but church as we have known it, man-made Christianity. The organizations that have held men captive and so on. That's becoming thinner and thinner because the next age is the kingdom. The hour in which we're living will take us right into the kingdom. And the kingdom is the Lord Jesus Christ rending the heavens and setting up his kingdom on the earth, bringing ten thousands of his holy ones with him. That's what's going to happen. And what we will do as soon as I can get back, I'll even wear this brace. <laughs> I'll even get on here and humble myself in front of all my streamers and wear this silly looking brace if I have to just to get back in here and start teaching this about, about uh, the, the seven church ages and the, and the teachings and the admonitions. But the first age, the Ephesian age, went to about 170 A.D. The second church age, Smyrna, went to about 312 A.D., which is right around the time of Constantine, and we'll talk about some of that. Then you go to 606 in the Pergamum church age, and it's very interesting some of, the, some of the dynamics with the city of Pergamum, and we'll get into that, and how it relates to the admonitions that are given to the church of Pergamum. And I, lo I, love, I love the blessing that is given to the church of Pergamum because it says, To him that overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a new name written upon a white stone that no man knows save him that receives it. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that when we get to it. There's some incredible revelation there. Then the Thyatiran age uh, goes all the way over to 1750. It's the, lo it's the longest. And of course, I mean, to 1520, I should say. And we know that 1520, I say 1520, some people say 1512. Um, 1520 is when Martin Luther was called before the Diet of Worms, uh, which is where they called him in and labeled him a heretic and uh, they gave him an opportunity to recant. Uh, they said, if you do not recant what you have been teaching and preaching, we will label you a heretic, which meant that anyone could kill him and be blessed by the church for doing it. That's what it meant. When you were labeled a heretic, uh, anyone could kill you, and they would even pre-bless you for doing it if you killed a heretic. <laughs> and so what they did is they brought Martin Luther in. They threatened him uh, with a label of a heretic, and he, and he does this the most amazing thing. Uh, he stands before this council at the Deed of Worms and he slams his staff down and he says, unless you can show me by the scriptures, I cannot and I will not recant. And it is recorded that that act of defiance, that act of courage by that man launched something in the realm of the spirit that literally changed Christianity. Now we talked about this some in the last webinar where you know, Martin Luther made some mistakes, but he got that right. You know, I applaud that man for having the courage to make that stand and do what he did and the role that he played in launching us into what has now become modern Pentecost.
because it led us right over into the Philadelphian age, the, the age of the, the, of the missionaries, this great missionary age where you have John Wesley as the predominant messenger and, and, and all the great things. I'm going to spend a good bit of time there talking about the Moravians and how he was saved, how John Wesley was saved uh, on a ship on his way to America to be a missionary. <laughs> he was on a ship to be a missionary and got saved on the ship <laughs> uh, to be a missionary because the ship um, came upon a storm, a severe storm. And it just so happened that there were a group of people in the, in, in the, uh, in the, in the cheaper sections of, of the ship called Moravians. And uh, the ship was in great distress and they were throwing things overboard and there was a real th threat. People thought their lives were at stake. And, and uh, John Wesley happens upon these people that were just praying and rejoicing and, and uh, singing. And, and uh, the story goes according to his own journal. This is recorded in John Wesley's journal. He goes to them, he says, aren't you aware of the fact that our lives are in jeopardy? And they said, yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> they thought, well, you know, if we live, we live for Christ. If we die, we're, we're face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. They had a revelation. And, um, and so uh, that, that act of faith that John Wesley saw changed his life. He said right then and there he got saved. And uh, the rest is history, as they say, of how that man of God <laughs> rode his horse over, I forget now, how many tens of thousands of miles preaching the gospel teaching the, the, the church of that age, the washing of the water of the word and so on, many more messages that came with it. And then of course, you know, you see the final church age, which began around 1906, which of course uh, was Azusa Street. I think it's clear, clear to say that the Philadelphian age came to an end. You see this overlapping season. It didn't just hap happen overnight uh, because it's, it's interesting. You know, I said this last time, but but even before Azusa Street happened, there were a few people in the Philadelphian age that began to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in other words, uh, William J. Seymour and Charles Parham were not the very first ones to talk about Acts chapter 2. There were some others that began to get the revelation. They just didn't have that breaker anointing. The timing was not yet right for there to be a breakthrough anointing. And, uh, and that, that privilege, that anointing fell upon William J. Seymour and, and, and at Azusa Street when he began to preach Acts chapter 2 and, and it launched something into the realm of the Spirit and people came from all over the world to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and, and modern Pentecost was birthed. And, and I'm going to spend a lot of time in, in the Laodicean age because there's just so much we can glean from that because it's the one we've been living in. I don't think anyone can argue that this has been lukewarm Christianity. 20, the 20th century church will be identified as the age of lukewarm Christianity. Uh, that's why we know, that's why we know the order of these churches is very relevant because anyone with any clear, honest analysis of the 21st century church or the 20th century church um, will come to the conclusion that uh, though they thought they were rich and increased in goods, thinking they had need of nothing, the Lord says they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And we had a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's why the flying eagle anointing was so important. That's why the flying eagle anointing was so important to fall upon a body of people that were thinking they were in one condition, but were in another. The flying eagle anointing is the antidote to deception. And deception permeated the 20th century. You might say, how do I know that? Because Jesus said so. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said so. Because he said, you think you're rich and increased in goods, having need of nothing. In other words, you think you're in one condition, but you're deceived, you're in another. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's deception. And so what do you need to, to overcome deception? A revelation. A revelation. Uh, wouldn't it be awful to, to um, I know many of us used to have these dreams, you know, that that uh, we, were we thought we were clothed, but go out in public and we're actually naked. Well, that's the Laodicean perspective, thinking that you're ready for battle, but you're naked, you're ill-equipped, you're not prepared. And it takes a revelation, it takes a flying eagle anointing to fall upon a body of people. And as they, as they become aware 
They repent. That's what it says, repent. And when you repent, then the Lord begins to restore you back to that condition. He begins to equip you and anoint you and fill you with His Spirit and clothe you with all these garments that we need for the final battle. That's what the whole end time scenario is all about. It's a war. We need to, we need to realize that. The Lord is a warrior. We talked about the word that I, I gave, had a, a few weeks ago. The Lord is arousing himself as a man of war because the last age is a, an age of war. Conflict. Conflict. We need to understand that. We're living in an hour of conflict. And God wins. Period. It's as simple as that. God wins. So I hope I have done <laughs> a little bit of a job helping you understand just briefly what the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle are and how they pertain uh, how they are the antidote, how they are the opposing, how they are the remedy, the, the, the empowering that we need to, to overcome the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse, and all of the spiritual dynamics that go with that. Uh, I don't have time now, but I will go into the, to the creeping locusts. Well, actually, the swarming locusts, the creeping locusts, the stripping locusts, and the gnawing locusts. I'll teach uh, how... Um, Joel chapter 2 was very relevant, how the Lord planted a tree, a bride tree, and how the enemy came in first to destroy the, the fruit of the tree, then the leaves of the tree, then the bark of the tree, and then, of course, uh, that, that locust gnawed into the very heart of the tree to destroy it. Those are not four different critters. It is four stages of the same locust or four molts. Here again, I know that's a lot of information. Just hold that thought, and we'll dig into it again as we come back and, and, and approach uh, uh, the seven church ages. So amen. Um, that's it in a nutshell. I realize, of course, that I gave you a lot of information, a lot of information, but we're going to, uh, we're going to go into it, the Lord willing. Um, you know, thank you so much for your prayers and committing to pray and Thank you for praying for Wanda and I, you know. Um, I, I love my wife very much. She is the most noble person I know. That's the truth. And, um, you know, she's doing what she feels like she needs to do right now. And, and uh, you know what, I love her. And um, I, I, I pray for her every single day. And I hope you will too. And, um, and I hope you'll pray for our ministry. And uh, because we're going we're gonna to need it. We're going to need our friends. But you know what? Um, that's what this is all about, being an overcomer. And uh, God's on the throne. He rules and reigns. And uh, if I didn't believe that, I would, I would be in very, a very bad position right now. But I believe that with every ounce of my being. The Lord Jesus Christ reigns. And He is victorious. And there is nothing anybody can say that would change my mind about that. God's word is eternally true, period. Heaven and earth will pass away, but that word will not fail. And he will have a victorious people. He will have a bride that is without spot or wrinkle. He will raise, if I'm not the, the only voice, if I'm not the voice, somebody else will be. There will be a voice a voice to the bride of Christ that will make her ready. And there will be many voices. There will be many messengers. And God's going to anoint them. He's going to give them the power we need to make a people ready to, to combat this thing. The enemy doesn't play fair. <laughs> but, neither, but you know what? God doesn't either because he rules. And he has all power in heaven and earth. I could just so right now so many scriptures are just bouncing around in my head that, that just deal with the goodness and glory of God. That he overcame, he stripped the enemy of his power and he gave all authority, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him and now he's turned around and given us that authority. He has taken away death, hell, and the grave. The Bible says, worthy is the lamb Worthy is the Lamb to take the book and break its seals, for thou wast slain and purchased for God with thine own blood, men of every nation, tongue, tribe, and kingdom. And he has made them to be kings and priests, and they will rule and reign in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Amen, amen. I hope, uh, I hope I have shared things in a way that is understandable and I hope I didn't share too much information about our personal thing, but I just felt uh, to be transparent with you because I know you love us. And I love you, Caleb, sitting here and we were just talking about how, how, how loyal our, our guys are. And, uh, and uh, anyway, I don't, I don't want to get emotional. Uh, thank you. Already getting encouragements. So, uh, I will see you just as soon as the Lord is willing. So, Lord, bless our streamers. <clears throat> bless our friends. They're our friends, not just our streamers. They're our friends. Fill them, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Give them the flying eagle anointing, Lord. Let every person within the sound of my voice soar above all the schemes of the devil. Grant that I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.